Good morning, everyone, and welcome to, well, good morning on the West Coast and good afternoon on the East Coast and whatever time zone you're in for the rest. We're very excited to the first edition of our Google Hangout on Air. The second Friday of every month, we actually meet with very interesting people in a field of business, life, and technology. And no one is more interesting and the company more interesting than the guest we have today. His name is Paul Green, and I will introduce him in a moment. First, I think we need to talk a little bit about his company and why him specifically and his company is so interesting. In a world of relentless pursuit of perfection, I think certain companies realize that based on a lot of different trends, new workforce, technology input, it's not just a question of finding a relentless pursuit of perfection for the equipment you buy or the processes you have, but it's also about looking at perfection in management, in how you deal with people. And the company we're talking about, which is Morningstar, which is one of the world's largest, if not the world's largest, tomato processing company, is actually headquartered in Central Valley of California. And this company decided from its creation to relentlessly pursue that quest of, um, of uh, being able to um, work optimizely, optimally from different angles. And this company now has been published in different articles, in different publications like the Harvard Business Journal, New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal and others. And I was very, very fortunate to meet with them during one of my workshops. As a matter of fact, I heard about this company about a year ago when they were published in the Harvard Business Journal. I was actually giving out a workshop and one of my CEOs say, oh, did you read this article talking about process and how to optimize your workforce that was just published about this company? Never heard of the company, and frankly, the name of the company is a misnomer because many people think about Morningstar either as a financial company or for a vegetarian like me. They think about Morningstar as, 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 as a product uh, that, are, that kind of looks like me, but it's not really meat-like. And this company, outside of, um, of, uh, of uh, the Central Valley, actually spawn something called the Self-Management Institute. And it's actually from the offices of the Self-Management Institute that Paul is, uh, is joining us today. Uh, we're here in San Diego from the office of Session 3.0. Next to me is Dante that is working and sweating a lot on his, uh, on his technical expertise to do our Google Hangouts. And I'm going to turn it straight to Paul because I think he has so much interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, first, let me introduce Paul uh, very briefly. Paul started actually at Morningstar in 1998 as what's called a seasonal colleague, meaning that he was working actually at the plant and doing some lab testing. He left in 2002 and then came back in 2006. He was so interested by the business model that actually in 2008 he co-founded the Self-Management Institute. Just to give you an idea of the reach that they have with the concept of self-management, Paul was awarded the McKinsey Harvard Business Review and Prize for Management Innovation. So Paul, the floor is yours. Hi everyone and thanks Philippe. Um, so I'm going to give you a, just a very quick bit of background about Morningstar. As Philippe said, we are the largest processor of tomatoes in the world. Um, we're kind of an under the radar sort of company. You've, you've never heard of us. Uh, we produce uh, products that are ingredient products for large consumer branded food companies. Um, but as Philippe said, I think one of the things we're most noticeable, notable for and one of the things that we, we strive obsessively to do is build the, the uh, most excellent organization imaginable. And um, we've been working on this for years since uh, uh, predating my time here, since 1990 actually. Um, and, and so I'm going to very quickly kind of give you a little bit of background. We have no structural hierarchy. We have no managers. In fact, we have no titles in the company. We have no um, difference, differing right sets. So, for example, purchasing authority is not designated to a handful of people. There's universal purchasing authority across the enterprise when you come on board at Morningstar. Um, people have the right to get involved wherever they see fit. People have the right and actually kind of create their own deal within the company in terms of what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of liberty, a lot of freedom, a lot of um, self-directed uh, work. And, uh, and of course, as, as I said, no hierarchical 
structure. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about kind of where that comes from for us from a, a conceptual standpoint, why we've done this, and then talk a little bit about it at a very high level, some of the systems, and then Philippe, we can maybe take some questions and you can, you can kind of, we can fill in the blanks based on the questions people have. Absolutely. Uh, so I want, to, I want to start off with uh, talking about the foundation for us. And, and when I say foundation, I'm talking about um, what is the foundation of self-management? Why have we decided to do things the way we do it? And for us, it starts with a, a philosophy. We do have a, a, a stated philosophy uh, that has everything to do with um, what makes for the most, um, the highest performing societies. And we, we do think of a business as a society in miniature, as a miniature human society. So what makes for the highest performing societies? Number one, I think uh, our thought is that happiness yields maximum performance. So individuals have got to be happy. In fact, we've always had the perspective that the organization as a, as a, is a human technology, and the purpose of that human technology is to enable individuals to uh, improve their life. And so individuals join up with an organization, either as an employee, we call them colleagues, or as a supplier or a customer or, or an owner, it, regardless of the role, people choose to join up with an organization because they're striving to have a happier life. And um, in, in achieving that higher level of happiness, they, um, they end up performing at a higher level. Uh, one of the things that we've always felt is that people are happiest when they have control over their lives and the things that are important to them. And so if you think about someone joining up your, within your organization, they're uh, presumably, they're, they're applying to your organization, they're coming to be a part of your organization because they feel like they have something to add, they feel like there's a need that your organization has and that they can fill that need. And in all likelihood, when they, when they start, they're pretty excited, they're pretty jazzed, they're, they're pretty engaged, they're, they're relatively happy and overjoyed um, to, to be a part. And, um, and the game is keeping them at that level of, of happiness and contentment and fulfillment. We've always felt like um, putting in place an organizational system, an operating system that allows them control over the things that are important to them, like how they do their work, is a, is a critical component of that. So it's one leg of the philosophy. Um, also, we, we've had this notion that self-management and total responsibility, uh, these two things are the way people live their life outside of work. And when I say self-management, I'm talking about the functions of manage, management, planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. Traditionally, most organizations, most companies, most businesses, most nonprofits even, have, have built a set of organizational rules that assign the functions of plan management, planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling to a subset of their employee population. When in reality, that's not the way life works outside of work. When people leave the doors of your organization, whatever your organization is, they walk into a world where they're responsible for managing their life. They're responsible for planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. And the most successful among us do a pretty good job of that. And, um, and so our thought is that it seems to work pretty well in the world outside of work, so can we make that work in the world inside of work? Because it seems to be, uh, in our mind at least, it seems to be a very efficient way of doing things. The idea that we have to have a whole separate group of people who are responsible for planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling from a purely sort of efficiency perspective, it doesn't seem very efficient. Can we embed that in the day-to-day -day role and function of every employee in the, in the enterprise? And then the idea of total responsibility, it's the way you live your life at work. And I don't want to get too in depth here, but most organizations kind of have this perspective that you have a job description, and job description fills up a piece of paper, and the boundaries of that paper, the edges of that paper, is also where your responsibility ends. So if your job is to do is to sweep the floors, for example, well, responsibility ends at whether or not the floors are swept. But in reality, that's not how life works at home. At home, it doesn't really matter so much what your activities are. When it comes down to your, your home life failing, regardless how big or how small your activities are, you have to bear the consequences of that. And that's Quite honestly, I think that's the world most of us prefer to live in, and so we've tried to embed that in our organization. It doesn't matter how big or how small your activities are, how, how, how significant or insignificant an outsider might view your role. Um, practically speaking, you have total responsibility for the enterprise, and that means you have the right to get involved anywhere you see fit. You see things that, are, uh, that need to be done differently that are not necessarily your deal. 
you're expected to get involved there. Uh, and, and consequently, though, I mean, if you can't really expect people to have total responsibility if they don't have total freedom, and I already talked about the purchasing authority. People have purchasing authority when they come on board at Morningstar. People have the right to get involved anywhere. They have the right to kind of direct their own work and, and build things the way they want to build them. Um, so that's kind of the, the philosophical foundation for us, and it flows completely out of the idea that, number one, there's got to be a more efficient way of doing things than this very st structural hierarchy that most organizations have built around, number one. And number two, that business as usual doesn't tend to make people very happy, and, and so we've got to come up with a different way of doing things. Um, and so from a philosophical standpoint, I, mean, I hope that makes sense to people, but the question obvious often comes to, okay, I got that, I understand it. In fact, at some level I agree with that, but how? And this, this makes sense because most people have been conditioned based on all of their experiences through life that this is what an organization looks like. And think about it, you've never, most people have never even actually asked themselves that question. You go apply for a job somewhere, you don't really have to ask what is the structure of the organization and maybe who fills what box, who sits at what level in the hierarchy. You know, that's a fair question, but nobody really asks what is the structure of this organization. We just all walk around with this natural assumption of what an organization is. And so the how really matters a lot here. So I'm going to give you some perspective, certainly not as deep as, as I would love to, but I think it starts with us with a set of principles, and it's really a fundamental set of rules of human interaction. And I'm not going to go too in-depth here. I mean, there's a number of them. You can go to our website. I'll give you our website a little bit later, and you can read all the, the principles. But one of the key ones is direct communication and gaining agreement. And, and we work really hard to embed the idea in people in our enterprise that um, communication around things like differences of opinion. When in real, and in reality, a lot, of the, a lot of the, when people ask questions or are skeptical or trying to figure out how things work, it always comes down to, well, what if I want to do this and somebody else wants to do that? Or what if there's a difference of opinion of some sort? So a big part of what you have to build into your organization is a, is a way to resolve differences. And in most organizations, that's, that's a given. You, you take it to the manager, the manager makes a decision and says, this is the way we're going to go. Morningstar, it's completely different. It's direct. So if I have a, uh, a difference of opinion, Philippe, with you about anything, big or small, um, I'm expected to resolve it directly with you. Um, now, practically speaking, not every difference of opinion can be resolved just with the two of us. And so the next step of our gaining agreement process, you get a third party, someone that's independent but you both can trust. They're not a judge. Their job is to try to help you arrive at an agreement of some sort by adding some a third party perspective. If that doesn't work, you get a group of colleagues, six to ten additional colleagues who you can both agree, um, reasonable, responsible, exercise good judgment. And again, their, their job is to try to help you reach agreement. Final step in the process, we do have, we're a privately held company, we do have our founder owner who's very committed to our way of doing things. Final step is he'll join the panel and try to help uh, the two initial parties reach agreement. Uh, barring anything else though, he does uh, drive to the final decision. So, but the, the major point here is you have to have a set of principles that guide how things happen. And it has to be very, very clear um, because nature kind of abhors a vacuum. And, and if you walk into a, an organization where you say, we're going to have all this freedom and responsibility and that sort of thing, but you don't really routinize the way some of these things get done, you can end up with a, a uh, probably a pretty negative situation. Um, again, on, on how, so how we do things. And that's another thing is we've got a number of systems that we've developed. Number one is the clue. We call it the colleague letter of understanding. And at a very basic level, this is an agreement that you have with your colleagues about what it is you're going to do here within the organization. And they tend to be relatively specific. Each colleague, each person in the company has a clue, and their clue is with their fellow colleagues. Usually it's 8 to 12 different people. And these are the people that they're coming to provide services or product to. So uh, we try to... Do you, we try not to emphasize the fact that you're coming to work for Morningstar when you come to work for Morningstar. The idea we try to get across is that when you're coming in, you're here to provide services or products to other people within the enterprise. So your job over the first couple of weeks or months of being on board at Morningstar is to develop those relationships with the people who are going to be your customers, your suppliers. Um, outline the terms of those relationships. Make the commitments to them for what it is you're going to do. And of course, these clue agreements can be modified over time as things change, and they do. People grow, people develop, people find new things they want to be involved in. Um, 
So this is kind of our foundational system that we've developed. Um, way back at the very beginning, it was just a piece of paper. It's called a letter of understanding simply because it was a letter. Each colleague wrote out their letter on a piece of paper and took it around to their colleagues and had their colleagues sign off on it. We've migrated to a software system. We've got to the point in size where we have a software system, which has its own a few downsides to it. But, um, but practically speaking, there's a, it's probably a little bit small, but um, it's, it's on our, our company internet. And in fact, people, our colleagues can access it from even outside. Uh, and Paul, you designed this, right? Yes, we designed this in-house and built it in-house. And um, there's a, a number of components to it that I'll, I'll go into in very brief. But first, the first element is, is of the clue is your personal commercial mission. You've got to define what is my purpose for being at Morningstar. And every person in, in Morningstar has a personal mission. This is their mission. This is what it is they're here to do. Um, the next part is what is it you're going to do in order to achieve that mission. That's where it starts to get pretty granular. And you outline your specific activities to the level of granularity that really clearly defines it between you and your colleagues. Um, and we do that in a, in a software environment. And I'm not going to go too in-depth with, with the structural part of it because I don't think that's particularly important. Um, but this, this software, your clue is not only visible between you and your clue colleagues, but to everyone in the enterprise. So anybody has the ability to go in and look and say, what is Paul's deal with in the organization? What is it that he's committed to doing within the organization? And does that effectively serve his mission and his, and his clue colleagues? Um, and then the, the, the next part of that is what we call stepping stones. And that's Paul's come into the company. He's got this mission. He's got this... Uh, the set of activities he's committed to, but how do you measure performance of that? We're a very process focused company. I already mentioned that we're in food production and processing. So as you can imagine, we've got big factories and very, very structural linear processes. And so a lot of stuff is very easy to objectively, relatively easy to objectively measure. And so um, we tend to get data crazy at Morningstar and, uh, and, and measure things kind of obsessively. But each colleague as part of their clue has this dashboard in it, and it has all of their stepping stones. Um, and those are effectively the measures of performance for all of the activities that they've committed to. Um, we have the ability to present them, again, within our software system, which, which again, is publicly available. The, the ability to present them uh, historical trends over time at whatever level of granularity we have the data for. So. Uh, you can look at daily data, hourly data, annual data. You can look at it for just yourself. You can look at it for yourself compared to other colleagues. You can look at it for your location compared to other locations. Um, the idea here is, is that we feel like um, if you really expect people to effectively self-manage, number one, they have to have the freedom to plan their work, to structure their deal, but they also have to have very, very clear insight into performance on an ongoing active basis in order to make those decisions that they have n maybe in other organizations are not expected to make. Um, and then we've got this whole peer regulation and feedback element that uh, part of it is incorporated into the clue. So we have a uh, part of the clue software, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a screenshot of it here to show you, but part of the clue software has a, a clue colleague review. And this is kind of, generally speaking for us, it's kind of that more subjective part of being a part of an organization. So we've got all the subjective um, data, quantitative data, but how do you get to the qualitative stuff? And so each of your clue colleagues, you're expected to review them, and it's an open review. Uh, if I review Philippe, Philippe knows what Paul said about him. And the idea is that this is supposed to be um, my opportunity to provide Philippe with you know, feedback that can guide his improvement and personal development, because he is responsible for his own personal development. But we also have this process at the end of the year where everyone has to, at an individual level, as well as as a group, business unit level, everyone goes through a kind of a strategic planning process where they evaluate past performance, and they've got to present their performance to their colleagues in a, in a, we have this big meeting we host every year, and you've got to present your business's performance um, to all of your colleagues, and your colleagues have a chance to kind of pick it apart a little bit, not in an overwhelmingly negative way, but think about Think about uh, a company, um, a, a public company presenting to uh, you know, their shareholders at some point during the year. And your shareholders are kind of digging into the details of how you're performing and they're trying to evaluate, the, do these leaders of this business really have what it takes to continue driving performance upwards and, imp and improving? And in reality, a lot, of, um, 
a lot of what we've tried to do on uh, with all these systems is is around continuous improvement. Um, in fact, one of the things I didn't say about stepping stones I think is critically important to, to recognize is that we set the idea of stepping stones up from the perspective of what is perfect. We don't talk a lot about benchmarking with other organizations. We don't set arbitrary goals or arbitrary budgets. In fact, we refrain from doing that, sometimes to our own detriment. But the idea is that continuous improvement is a result of of people who look at the world a little bit differently. The way they tend to look at their world and performance is trying to figure out what would perfect look like, recognizing that perfect is unlikely to happen. But um, we use golf analogy a lot around Morningstar. And I hate to overuse sports analogies, but you know, perfect score in golf is 18. But you don't really ever hear anybody talking about 18. But if you, if, you're, if you sit down and talk with the pros, the people who are truly the best in the world, they don't really talk a lot about par. They're really focused on how can I get closer to perfect? How can I improve my game? And so stepping stones are always set up in the context of perfection. And this peer review process in the, the year is all about asking your colleagues, okay, you're operating at some level of performance that, and there's a clear gap between where you are and perfection. And we applaud you for the, the excellence that you've demonstrated at this point. But now what's your plan for getting to the next level of excellence? How are you going to get a step closer to perfection? And so the idea behind stepping stones for us is stepping closer to perfection over time. Um, and, and we depend heavily on peer regulation, peer feedback. This process in the year is a critical process. Not perfect. I, I will not say it's perfect. But it's a very critical process of applying that sort of social pressure to improve constantly. So those are some of the elements. I, there, there's certainly a lot more I can I can say, but I'm sure, sure. That there are some questions, and, and I thought maybe we can we can turn over to, to some questions and see what where I can fill in some gaps. Yeah, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, uh, I want to make sure that we make that slide specifically, you know, available when we put the video online, so people will be able to read it by themselves. Absolutely. And it as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's some questions starting to filtering, and uh, one of them is about the recruiting process. Okay. Yeah. Uh, success challenge. Do you go after a certain type of people? So we have uh, this. That's a very good question. So we have, um, as you as you might imagine, imagine we're we're kind of a research driven, a process research driven sort of organization. Part of what we do with the self management institute is really try to perform research and figure out. Uh, some of these things. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on is, is there a specific type of person, a quantifiably certain type of person that, that uh, is what we're looking for? And so far, we really haven't been able to find the, the formula for a perfect person. Um, I think the big thing that we found anecdotally is that people who have spent an, uh, an, an, a significant amount of time in more traditional sort of organizations, and they've risen through the ranks, and they've occupied senior leadership positions, they have a hard time in our, our organization. Say, so say that again? People that, people that have spent a significant amount of time in more traditional organizations and they've proven successful at rising through the ranks in those organizations, they have a hard time in our organization. So when we hire senior leaders out of other companies into our company, many, maybe even most of them struggle with an organization. And I think the major reason is that most organizations, their tool set for getting things done is completely different. It's very kind of force driven and not necessarily force in that bad way. It's not like slavery, but it's just a given in, a, a, in most organizations that once you, once you have this position, you have the authority to tell the other people what to do, and that simply doesn't fly at Morningstar. And so over time, I think most companies kind of condition people, or, or maybe, maybe most, peop most people lose the ability to tr tr be true leaders, what we see as true leaders. And, uh, and, and if you ask yourself, you know, if I were to go get hired in an organization, my job was to radically change the organization, but the terms of the deal was I didn't have any ability to force anybody to do anything. I had no unilateral control over anybody, and I had to convince them what would that be like. And that's what it's like at Morningstar. The problem is many senior people who come in have a hard time. Um, so, so does that mean that you promote a lot from within for senior position, or you're just lucky sometimes? Uh, you know what? We're we're you know we we have found that we can kind of gut feel people and their their sort of background and demeanor. Um, we had, but I think most of the people who kind of rise to to levels of kind of senior leadership in Morningstar tend to be, be people that grow up around Morningstar. Quite honestly, um, and that's I, honestly it's my personal preference, anyways. Um, so, so yeah, that's the one thing I will say about our hiring process is that we look at hiring a little different than most organizations. It takes a long time. 
our recruiting process takes weeks and weeks. In fact, we tell people when, when they first submit a, a resume, look, this may take six, eight, even ten weeks. You're going to meet with a lot of people, and you do. You're going to meet with all of your clue colleagues, and those people who you're going to be working with are the people that make the decisions. We don't have hiring managers. We don't have an HR department that is making these decisions. The people you're going to be working with are the people that are going to decide who they want to work with. And our thought is that they're going to be a lot more committed to you and be a lot more invested in your success in the organization if they're the people making the decision. They're not going to be able to cast that, uh, you know, you being a poor, poor performer off on some hiring manager somewhere. Um, and we look at it like getting married, too. So it's like in, in a date when you're dating someone there's no formula for what it means to fall in love and when it's good when it's okay to get married or not you can't put that down into a checklist it really comes down to we've got to spend enough time together to find out are our values the same do we see the world the same way do we want to spend time together and if you can get to that point where both of you agree then let's make a deal if not let's go our separate way and there's something one of the many things that is fascinating about your company and I did not share it because you're a private company can you give us an idea uh, to the audience. Can you give them an idea of, of the size, number of people working, and how you have some seasonal pro uh, colleagues versus? Yeah. So uh, revenue-wise, uh, yeah, and we are a private company, so we, we do get, we are a little stingy with details generally. But revenue-wise, we're about eight hundred million dollar year revenue company. Um, we have a little around four hundred year-round colleagues and about 2,200 seasonal colleagues, partial year colleagues. And that has a lot to do with the fact that we are a seasonal production company. So we've got these counter-cyclical seasons where different things are happening. It equals out to about 1,250 full-time equivalent colleagues. Um, so does that give you some perspective of the size of our company? Yes. And uh, how does that 8 to 10 weeks of getting to know the person apply for, I don't know, Entry level position is up, is applicable, but for people that are maybe more on the production line yeah. on a seasonal basis versus somebody that you know has, has a different role. That's a great question. No, in general, the 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 timeline is shorter for folks who are seasonal colleagues, and then even amongst our year round colleagues, that window of time uh, varies to some degree based on you know how routine your role, your perspective role is versus how kind of strategic or broad or ambiguous your role is. So amongst our seasonal colleague population is not as much time goes into hiring. The one thing I will say about our seasonal hiring though is we have extraordinarily high return rates so we really don't hire that many people. Our return rates uh, for example amongst our factories are between 96 and 100 percent year over year. Ooh. And these are, uh, you know, these these are transitory. CEO that would love to be close to that. <laughs> yeah. You know, quite honestly, sometimes I feel like maybe it's a little bit too high. Um, uh, you know, th there's a downside to having too high of a return rate. You know, people can start to get kind of comfortable and lax and not really focusing on that improvement thing because it's what they've done. But we have we have seasonal people, and, and again, these are transitory sort of co colleagues, people that you would generally expect to work, you know, season in a production facility and move on to construction and maybe go work on a farm somewhere. Um, but we have people that have been around uh, working se as seasonal colleagues longer than I've been associated with Morningstar since the early 1990s. So um, so I think it's a testament to the sort of organization we've tried to build. And uh, so we don't do a lot of hiring, quite honestly. So we got question right and left. And then one of the questions <laughs> is, uh, is, a, is a, not a challenge to you, but uh, uh, can you share your uh, uh, your uh, personal mission? My personal mission? Yes. Yeah, it's to uh, advance that's the audience we have, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's all right. I don't mind that. That's okay. To to advance and build the most excellent organization possible through the application and development of superior systems and principles of organizing people. So that gets me excited. It probably doesn't get you excited, and that's okay. I'm a little bit of a nerd, so. Um, uh, one of the rules on missions for us is that it's got to be something that hits you kind of at a gut level and gets you really jazzed up. So I'm I'm very excited about looking at Morningstar's organization and our company broadly and building the most excellent performing organization possible through the unique applications of systems and tools of organizing. Well, one of the one of the uh, question we had is um, t talking about the mediation process. You actually have people that whose main role is to be mediator? No, no we don't and uh, actually that's something that um, that 
uh, a few years ago, a number of colleagues brought up and said that we should do. And so we've started, we don't really have formally structured mediators, but we started, um, one of my colleagues, Doug Kirkpatrick, who, uh, uh, in a minute, I'll, I'll put up a link to our website, but I would, I would encourage you to go to our website. And somewhere on that website, there's a link to my colleague Doug's book. Doug wrote a pretty good book that, it doesn't tell the story of Morningstar, but it has a lot of similarities. But um, Doug put together some training for mediation, and our idea is that uh, we, we, we don't like to be selective about some of these skills that we really believe are fundamental skills to high performance in all aspects of your life. And we really believe that in order to live a very productive life outside of work, you need to be a good self-manager. And so our focus is if somebody is lacking in that mediation skill, let's provide an opportunity for them to develop the skill to you know, come, become certified in it, for lack of a better word. Um, so generally speaking, formally, no, we don't have designated mediators or any anything like that, but we have work to try to, to build a development plan for people to kind of develop that if that's something that they want to be able to do and to be able to offer to their calling say, hey, I can, I can be the mediator in this sort of situation. We do have a, a formal function we call clue facilitation that uh, I, would, I would say that we have not really done a great job and it's relatively new of, of really formalizing and part of their role conceivably is to act as this sort of formal mediator, but we've not really been able to get it to work the way we wanted it to work. And it's because in general, I think those clue facilitators are seen as outsiders to the specific situation, the specific sort of conflict that we have. And so people prefer someone that has some perspective. The whole idea of an outsider tends to, to gall people at some level. Good. Excellent. Uh, some question we have is, you know, CEOs, they want to know uh, results. Um, how are you better than the competition because of that? I mean, the philosophy, the way executed, is extremely seducing. Okay, um, so there's there's a couple of things here, and I'm I'm just going to give you a few anecdotal things, and you're just uh, you're going to have to take it for what it's worth again because we are a private company. So number one, um, we have worked to try to quantify this uh, over a couple of years, and to the degree that we can get information, it seems like amongst our direct competitors, or uh, and but even more broadly than direct competitors amongst you know companies in similar sort of businesses um, our revenue per full-time equivalent colleague is about at the top which basically says that in general we're creating more economic value per person within our enterprise than most competitors or most companies in similar sort of uh, industries so that's one indicator um, and you know anybody who wants to do their research can go out and spend the time and, and you know pull whatever information they can based on what I've told you here. Uh, so that's one indicator. Uh, an another indicator is that we have over we, we got into the tomato production business in 1990. We're now a completely fully, fully integrated company um, with uh, all the way from farming, transplanting, harvesting, greenhousing, through production and distribution, trucking company as well. Um, so we, we started as kind of a little upstart production company in 1990 and we've grown to become the largest production com uh, tomato processor in the world. We have the largest ag trucking company in the world during the time of year that we're, we're moving. Uh, in terms of harvesting, I think we're the largest harvesting operation. Uh, and I'm not pointing to, to the size itself as an indicator of success as much as I am trying to make the case that we have all of our growth has come through self-funded. Our, our profits have funded our growth over the years. We've never taken outside equity uh, aside from our owner who has, you know, built the company. Um, so I, I guess my point is our operations have funded us becoming, um, you know, the largest or among the largest in the world at most of what we do, uh, which I think says something about our performance. <laughs> well, I think it does. As a matter of fact, uh, we talked about this last time we met. Probably the next step, and that's something you're going to be pretty cautious about, would be maybe to acquire some company. Yeah. That's going to be a whole ball of wax for you, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's one of the things that it's on my kind of drawing board now is what does that look like? I mean, it's one thing to grow a company this way, to start a company this way. And when you grow up a certain way, you know, from a people standpoint, you're bringing people into a, a kind of a society that operates in a certain way and it's relatively easy to integrate them in there and I'm not saying it's easy perfectly easy but it's relatively easy but if you imagine acquiring a company walking into a company full of people that are accustomed to doing things the way they've always done them and say look here are the new rules 
we're we're not we're 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 pretty aware. We realize that it's not as easy as just saying here are the new rules. Structurally, there are some things that have to change, and so. One of the things that is on my drawing board that we're working on now here is figuring out how do we do that. What is the path? What is the what is the uh, what are the steps that need to be done in order to accomplish that? Yeah, this question is coming from me. It was um, a couple of weeks ago. I was giving a talk uh, at the National Employee Owned Conference. So it's a couple of weeks, as I say, in Seattle, and then it's basic company that are employee owned and uh, they meet and they give best practices. And uh, the general feeling that I got was that. There was no necessarily a direct correlation between being employee owner and f feeling that you participating and that your 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 role make a difference in in actual company. So and they and they really went to hard time trying to make the difference between employee owner and just having stocks in a company. So you know, are you you're not employee owned, are you? We are not, and I actually we are not employee owned, and. Um... I mean, I actually have some some opinions about that. Uh, practically speaking, I, we probably won't ever be fully employee owned. Um, I think the the way we have been structured has has worked just fine up to this point. I actually happen to think that there is a function for funding a business, and that's what owners do. They provide equity to fund the business, and there's a role for operating the business, and those are distinct roles. And uh, I honestly. You know, my opinion, and I know there's a lot of differing opinions about this, but my opinion is that I don't think that employee ownership really adds anything to the mixture um, in terms of trying to build what we're trying to build organizationally. It can be a sweetener, it can be icing on the top of the cake, um, but practically speaking, I'm, I'm not sure that employee ownership is a requisite part of the formula. It's certainly not for us, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't exactly work for your for your business model. Right. Okay. Well, let's take a little sec here to um, uh, remind the audience. We have about maybe five or six minutes left in our conversation. You can tweet your question at Sesson. Make sure that you use our name at Sesson in your in your comment. And we've been having a few of those. And then you can also uh, chat your question. So uh, when you reflect on your on your on your time at the company, I mean, you've decided to come back. So it's obviously something that really works for you. Um, where do you see yourself and the company in in five years? Maybe myself in the company. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think five years long term. I uh, my my passion and what I want to see happening is really the question you asked a little bit earlier about expanding the enterprise through acquisition is really helping to drive um, the overall strategy of the enterprise through you know, acquisitions and expanding to other parts of the world um, and more broadly as we do that really working to create a a broader family of organizations that are operating the way we operate we really believe that it's it's uh, one of our fundamental competitive advantages and um, my passion is really embedding that into or our organizations our family of organizations so um, you you hit on it a little bit earlier. That's what I want to be doing five years from now. Nice. And uh, last two questions. We just got one. Uh, do you actually measure happiness? Happiness. Um, it's a, that's actually a great question. We have not, uh, as a matter of routine, measured happiness. There have been a couple of times in the past where we have uh, had either outsiders come in or we've done internal surveys of happiness. Um, um, both amongst our year-round and our seasonal colleagues. And uh, it, it, for all intents and purposes, it appears that our colleagues tend to be very, very happy, very, very content. Um, as I mentioned, I, I think a couple of you know slightly more abstract indicators of happiness are the return rates amongst our seasonal colleague, and the fact that year-round turnover historically has been less than two percent a year. So very, very low turnover. Now that there, I, that want to caution you. I can't attribute that completely to. Or organ, our organizational system, um, we tend to compensate people well, um, slightly above industry average, and it's because we've, we've always felt like we ask a lot of people. We ask our people to operate at a level below above their peers in, a, in similar sort of companies, so we feel like that warrants additional money. So there's a possibility that people don't leave because, um, you know, they get paid more money here. So. I can't I, I can't say how much of our turnover or return rate is attributable to self-management, but I think it is an indicator, and we have um, a couple of 
windows where we have measured that objectively using survey sort of tools, anonymous sort of surveys, and it seems that um, people seem to be very, very content. And the uh, last topic is uh, something that really struck me with your company is how low-key you are and how you are really focused. I mean, if people don't understand what it means to be laser sharp focused into the pursuit of, of, of improving yourself, then uh, try meeting with those guys. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we, I'm very happy and we're all very happy to be able to do this and kind of share the knowledge. Uh, you know, articles have been written and stuff have been happening there. Um, you do have an event, though, that you, 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 you put together uh, for people that really want more info on this. And do you want to tell us a bit about that, and then we'll kind of wrap it around this? Sure. So, um, yeah, Philippe's right. We, did, we do tend to be kind of low-key, and it's not that uh, we don't want to tell people about what we've done. We're perfectly happy. Uh, we feel like uh, the, the more... We feel like this is a good thing for society, quite honestly. So we feel like the more people do something like this, the better the world is. And so that's fine. And we don't mind sharing. The problem is that sharing takes a lot of time and, and, and it's not really our central purpose. And um, so we, we tend to try to figure out ways to funnel people who are interested into something that's, um, that, does, that we can consolidate that time and get the most bang for the buck. So we have, uh, starting last year, we, we started, it's the first time we've ever done anything that we charged any money for, ever. Um, but we started hosting a, a small event at one of our facilities, and it's a two-day, we call it applied self-management, and we try to, in two days, kind of embed everything about Morningstar and self-management that we can to enable you to take that back and do something with. It's at one of our facilities, so you get to see one of our tomato processing facilities. You get to spend a couple hours with, uh, you know, six, eight, ten of our, you know, random colleagues from out in the factory who come in, and you can ask them any question you want. We try to be an open book. And we share all the warts and all, the things that we haven't got figured out, the things we're trying to get better at, the, the places where we think you know, things are broken. And um, that's the one time of year that we kind of open up and try to, to, to share with people. And um, so I, I'm going to put a, a screen up here that has um, some information. And you can go to, uh, number one, that's our, that's our Self-Managed Institute website at the top, and then the Morningstar Company's website, which has some stuff, including the Morningstar principles that I referred to earlier and a whole bunch of other things. And then the Supply Self-Management, September 16th and 17th in Los Banos, California. That's the website to go to for the Eventbrite uh, registration. Uh, now, I do have to say, this: we restrict this to 20 people, and we actually haven't opened this up yet. I mean, it's, it's available at Eventbrite. We haven't actually posted it on our website, and somehow... Uh, I just looked this morning, and we, we already have 10 registrations. So for whatever it's worth, if you're interested in coming, probably uh, go to the website pretty quickly um, and take a look. And feel free to, to go to the go to our website and drop me a note or drop us a note. There's contact information for myself and my colleagues there. If you have any questions or anything, we'll do our best to help you out. There's an enormous number of resources on the Self-Management Institute website. We've got some white papers, a number of videos, and really try to, to provide as much information as we can without it distracting us from what we're trying to do with that morning star so awesome um, and yeah we've got some comments that people are already checking this out already so I wouldn't great. be surprised if you get more people and the reason you limit it is really to get in, I mean this is in-depth qualitative information this is not just a dog and pony show here no not at all in fact it's um, there's a significant component of it that's a workshop and we really try to um, to spend the one-on-one -on -one time with people that's required in order for them to take these concepts and apply them at some level to their organization. So it's limited for a purpose. Again, this is not a money-making deal. You're not going to get this sort of thing. And I know there are, there are other companies. You're not going to get this sort of big conference thing. That's not what we're doing. It's not what we're about. We really don't care to spend time with people who are just looking for a flavor of the month sort of thing. What we want are the people who are really focused on this and really intent on trying to do something. And then we're going to give you two days of our time, try to, try to help you get to where you need to get. Yeah. All right. Well, last word. There's something that we share in common, which is we abhor people wasting other people's time, right? <laughs> and we both see this as a real, real, real. I mean, this is this is something that it's a pitfall of management. Any comment on that? Yeah. Uh, other than that, I agree with you completely. Um, you know, one of the things that I one one interesting thing that I t I tell people about our organization is that um, I think meetings are good but meetings can also be very, very bad. And uh, one of the interesting things about Morningstar is that um, you learn pretty early on that uh, just because you've 
called a meeting doesn't mean people are going to show up. And the idea that people have a choice matters a lot. And that means they, they get to evaluate the meeting and the value that they expect to get out of the meeting and the purpose of the meeting on its merits and not based on who it is that's calling the meeting. So um, you learn that pretty early on in Morningstar and it's kind of, it's really kind of, it, it, it hits you pretty hard when you call a meeting and nobody shows up. It tells you either A, you're not really a leader or B, what you're doing is wasting people's time. And so I think there's an enormous amount of value to that. That's actually scary to some people. I'm not going to lie to you. It's scary to some people. But it forces you to really think through what am I asking for people's time for and what value are they going to get out of it. And it makes you frame up what you're doing in a way that forces you to get to something that's practically meaningful. Absolutely. All right. On those good notes, let's wrap this, um, this Google Hangout. First and foremost, thank you so much, Paul. It was it was awesome, very substantive. I'm sure we're gonna have a little bit more information coming out of some questions, which I'll follow up for, uh, with you. Absolutely. And we'll post the slide and all of this on our site, and we'll follow up. And uh, you know, we'll keep getting contact and uh, and, and spread the good word of, of self management. Correct. And also, I want to tell the audience about our uh, uh, once a month, second Friday of the month, we have this uh, Google Hangout coming up. And this Google Hangout is really uh, about meeting interesting people in the industry. What we have coming up next month would be um, a Google Hangout with a company called Scoopit. And Scoopit is a company that leads the curation movement and help people, especially when they are selling to other businesses, make sense of curation and actually putting content outside. Then in June, I'm sorry, it's going to be in July, we're going to have a meeting with uh, Sprout Social that basically helps companies like us and many others to make sense of social media by using different reporting, some templates, and actually discovering content you can use. we we'll probably go dark in August because, you know, August, you know, it's in San Diego, we're probably going to go surfing, I won't lie to you. But we'll be back in September, and then in September we have a great content as well. We're going to have a writing coach. Her name is Lyndon, and she's going to tell us a secret on how to write a better yourself. Just stay, stick around for that one. And of course, last by not least, the unsung hero of the performance. I'm going to move the camera to him. Where are you? There you are, Dante, that has been suffering in silence and actually giving us all those good questions. All right, everyone, that's a wrap from San Diego and Sacramento. Have a great day. Thank you.